Lesson 15, Revenge of the Three Ring Binder. I had no idea how much this thing was going to contribute to GD&T, but it just keeps on giving. I think there's going to be a tendency for you to go, oh, I know where he's going with this, and just leave the video. I'm going to touch on some subtle stuff here that may not be apparent right away. It's, I think it's going to stretch your brain a bit, so uh, stay tuned. If you remember the last two videos on composite and multiple single segment, I was using my laser on my mill to cut holes in printer paper so that it would fit in the three ring binder. Then my wife says, hey, why don't you just use this three hole punch that I've got. That way you can just take your paper, drop it in there. Boom, there's my three holes. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a little bit faster. So I'm doing that now and it works great. But if I do this long enough, you know, no two pieces of paper are exactly the same size. So what is the biggest piece of paper that would fit in this? Well, if we don't want it hanging out of the top and the bottom of the binder, the biggest piece is probably the size of the binder. So that's really the biggest piece we could handle. And what's the smallest piece that we could put in there? Well, if we don't want it hanging out of the edge and we still want to have a hole in here for the, uh, well, for all three of them, then that's probably about as short as we could get. So that's really the maximum variation in size that we can stand with the, with the width of our paper. So the next question is, what are we going to do with our punch? We know that it has to be this big to fit this largest piece of paper, right? Those jaws just have to be that far open. So what are we going to do when we drop in a nominal size piece of paper or our smallest size piece of paper? Are we going to adjust this for every single one so that it keeps everything perfectly on center regardless of the size of the paper? It would certainly be easier if we could just leave this at one size and run everything through rather than having to sit here and adjust for every piece that comes in, right? So what would that look like? Well, when I put one of the bigger pieces in here and punch it, my holes are exactly lined up. They can't even, they can't be anywhere else. And I go to drop that in the binder and it sits right in the middle with very little movement on each edge. But when I drop the smallest one in, I can shift it this way and punch it, and shift it this way and punch it. Those are the maximum extremes of my holes, and that, that's huge. But what happens when I go to put it in the binder? Hey, it's still not hanging out of the edge. And I can go the other set of holes and it's still not hanging out of the edge. So it still fits even though there's that much variation. So we could say that every bit that I make this page smaller increases the variation of where the holes can be, right? Or does it? Let me ask it another way. What if I take a nominal piece of paper and shove it to one side to punch two of the holes and then shove it to the other side to punch the last hole. Does that fit the binder? Okay, I can get one to go or I can get these two but I can't get that last one to fit. But wait a minute, I thought that it was okay that the smaller the paper got the more I could shift the position of those holes. Something's not right here. That little trick that I did when I punched these holes that I shifted it between it, apparently that doesn't work. It's okay for me to be this way or that way, but I have to put in all three holes at once at whatever position that I'm in. Does that make sense? Okay, I want you to help me build a call out around this requirement and we'll figure it out together. Here's our print for our piece of paper. So we've got our max min set up for the width. We've set up datum A as the top surface, datum B as that back edge where we're gonna shove it into the three hole punch, and then datum C, because it's aligned with our width dimension, we know that it refers to the center plane of the width. 
But of course we have our three holes up at the top and we need to apply our call out for those holes. So because there's three of them, of course, we're gonna have our three X for the holes of some diameter, plus or minus, blah, 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 who cares? We already know how to do that stuff from lessons one through three, but it's not enough just to set the size, we need to set the position. So let's make room here and we bring in our position tolerance. And of course you recognize the dart symbol and our bullseye and our circle M because this is a classic pegs and holes problem that we totally know how to do. Again, lessons one through three, or if you want to see the detailed calculations, check out the study guide. I go over that just over and over and nail that down so you can totally understand it. We also know that because of the circle M, as our diameter deviates from maximum material condition, we end up with some bonus tolerance, the orange area, that allows those holes to deviate even more from the basic dimensions of where we locked them down. But what about datums? Primary datum A, secondary datum B, that back edge, and tertiary datum C on the width. Now, first question, are any of these datums a feature of size? What's a feature of size? Well, basic question is, can I measure it with a set of calipers? Well, can I measure this flat surface A with a set of calipers? Eh, not really. Can I measure datum B, this edge, with a set of calipers? Not really. Datum C? Hey, now I have a width. Okay, if my calipers could open another half inch, I could measure that width. But you get the point. A feature of size means I can have opposing points that I can take a measurement off of that gives it size, and then it's a feature of size. So clearly C is the only datum that's a feature of size. So it's the only one that's eligible to even have a circle M. And this makes complete sense, right? Because as we lay out our binder, we know that as that piece of paper deviates from its max, we get that room for this thing to move around, which contributes to the bonus tolerance for our holes, right? <coughs> Wrong! This thing can move back and forth, and yeah, it does allow the holes to drift, but it is not bonus tolerance. We saw what happens when C deviates from max, and we try to add that as bonus tolerance to one of the holes. It doesn't fit anymore. This hole won't go on to that peg. So yes, you get movement out of this, but it's not bonus tolerance. These are datums. So whatever shift you get from the datum being smaller than max is called datum shift. That's what it is. Bonus tolerance is applied to the bullseye. Datums make datum shift. They are two different things. Now we've all been there. You're inspecting a part to see if it's in print. You see how much the diameter deviates from max add that to the position tolerance that you've already got. So great, I've got this bonus tolerance. And then we look down the call out and we see this other circle M. We go, do I get to add that back to here? And of course, we know we can't. And now you know why. You can just think of the notebook and whether that peg is going to go in the hole when you try to add the datum shift to the hole position tolerance. So how does an inspector use the circle M next to the C? Well, you can think of a gauge that is a lot like this binder. As long as the inspector can stay inside of C and get those holes to drop in, you know it's a good part. But if I bring this in, and to get the pegs to go in the holes, if I have to bring the edge of the part outside of C to get it to drop on, it's no good. 
I have to be able to keep C within the bounds of that max material condition to get the holes to line up. Then you know it's a good part. Okay, so what have we learned? We learned what a feature of size was, that you have to be able to measure it with opposing points. We learned about regardless of feature size, which is when you're putting parts onto that three-hole punch and you're planning on adjusting the width of the guides for every single part that goes in versus just setting it to, to MMC so you can drop in whatever you want to. That's the consequence of it. We learned that when we do apply that circle M on the datums, it's datum shift that it does not apply to the bullseye because that's where all our virtual condition calculations come from. Okay, we made it to the end of another lesson. If that was helpful, please subscribe to this channel or heck, go check out my other channel where I'm building all those other cool projects like generating hydropower from the rain or a computer controlled Etch-a-Sketch. Either way, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.